today we're going to talk about the Civil 3D survey template and what it takes to create it. Um, as some of you may have known uh, from Tuesday's webinar, uh, Civil 3D likes to be broken down into about three basic templates. Um, a survey template for the surveyors, which will handle the topos, the altos, plats, things that surveyors handle, and then a design template for the civil engineers who are doing their roads, their site grading, their pipe networks. Um, and the reason for this is Civil 3D likes things small. It's better to have four small things than one big thing. And the same thing goes true for templates. It's better to have three smaller templates than to have one template that will uh, encompass everything. Uh, for reason, uh, the surveyors aren't going to care about any of the layers that may be developed for the civil engineers, if it's a pipe network or if it's um, site grading it or a new road. So why give a surveyor all those extra layers, all those extra styles that they'll never use? Only give them a template that is specific to them. About 100 layers or so is about average for a surveyor's template. You start adding a surveyor's template and a civil engineer's template in with each other, and now you're pushing four, 500 layers and some I have seen over 1,400 layers. Obviously way too much just for a survey. Um, the third template is the plan production. That's nothing more than what's going to be plotted out in paper space. It just takes what drawing size you want to plot it to, uh, the viewport scale size, and then when you're doing alignments, it's going to determine um, how many sheets it's going to take to fulfill that alignment. Um, so the, again, the reasoning, uh, keep the templates small. It's a lot easier to manage the layers, the styles, and create the templates based on um, disciplines. Obviously, you're not going to have a, a template that's going to encompass um, some civil and some surveying. Um, so break it up based on the, the project rules. So today, we're going to talk about the survey template. So what does it take to create a survey template? Um, wh what do you want to start with? Where are we going to start at? Um, Object data layers, very key with civil. Um, we'll talk about the description key set. Um, we'll talk about the figure prefix, database, uh, line work code sets. Uh, we'll get into a little bit about point groups. Um, having a template automatically have a surface created for you when you bring in your points, so a predefined surface. We'll talk about the layer manager and how to control things uh, like the color, line weight, line type. Um, we'll get into styles. Styles are as we mentioned before, the, the building bone uh, behind templates. Its styles are what make your objects look the way they do. And then at the end, we're actually going to talk about user-defined properties. User-defined properties um, will allow us to bring in information above and beyond the point, northing, easting, zenith description. We'll be able to bring in um, a, a location, a measure down, um, a direction and add that into our point file and then use it in a label style to, for say, shoot a catch basin and not only will it tell me the rim elevation but it will actually give me the invert elevation and the direction of the invert. Um, so it's a way to almost eliminate the human error possibilities um, by having the computer do it for you. So what template to start with? Um, you have two templates for the most part. One is the AutoCAD template. The other one is the Civil 3D, um, since we're in Minnesota or the United States, the Imperial template. Obviously, we could start with the metric template if we were dealing with metric mostly. You have the AutoCAD template, which is the basic AutoCAD. That is nothing more. It has no civil objects in it. It has no civil styles in it. So you got to start everything from scratch. Whereas the Civil 3D template has a handful of styles for every scenario, every situation. We actually recommend that you start with the AutoCAD template instead of the Civil 3D because it's easier to add styles, add object data layers, add layer managers than it is to delete it. And the reasoning is because things get referenced. A layer will get referenced by an object data layer. 
I'm not able to delete that layer because it's referencing the object data layer, so it won't let me delete it. Um, a style could also be referenced in an object data layer or within uh, the creation of a civil object. So I won't be able to delete a style if it's referenced somewhere else. So it's a lot easier to start from nothing and then reference that style into a civil object and then that civil object linked to a specific layer. Um, so in essence, um, the styles are a lot more powerful than layers. Uh, a layer, we basically use it to turn the object on and off. The style we're going to use to control the way it looks. So we'll start with the AutoCAD template. And I will quickly demonstrate the object data table. And that's what I have right up in here. You have all the type of functionality that Civil 3D can create. Uh, alignments, uh, fittings for uh, pipe networks, gratings, mass hall lines, parcel segment lines. All these are object layers. And what it's saying on here is if I create an alignment, put it on layer zero. If I would have started with the Civil 3D template, that alignment would have gone to um, a C uh, alignment layer. We don't want that, especially for our survey template, because the surveyors aren't going to create an alignment. They're not going to create a catchment area. A, they're only going to be worried about general notes, grid surfaces, potentially, and then survey figures, surfaces, tin surfaces, and survey networks. So by starting with the ACAD template, I was able to have all this set to zero, and then I just manually came in and changed the seven, eight object layers that I needed to be referenced. A lot easier to change eight than to change 70. So this is telling me that the general note, it's always, every time I add a, a note, it's going to go on to the V-anal layer. Anytime I add a grid surface, it's always going to go on to the V-topo surface. And then a grid surface labeling, so the contours along that line, um, they're always going to fall on the V-topo anal layer. One other feature you may know of within the object layer is these modifiers. If I add these modifiers to uh, the object layer, every time I create a new surface, so like down in here, anytime I create a new tin surface, this modifier, this star modifier, is going to say put it to a new layer. So I could have four, five surfaces that I created in this drawing, and with that modifier of the asterisk, it's going to create a brand new layer for each one, another way of handling layer control. So that's one way of uh, making things a little more independent. I have the capabilities of creating five tin surfaces, and they all fall on five different layers. So I can turn off each layer as need fit, or I could go into the style and I actually just switch it to no display. Um, but that's object layers. And the reason for that, again, is it's easier to start with the ACAD template to have all these start start at zero and then populate the ones we need. Uh, description key sets. What is a description key set? A description key set is basically, you could call it a database that contains all survey points. Not 90% of your survey points maybe 97%. You'll have those eyeballs that'll come up once every two years. You don't really need them in there. If you want to put them in there, it just makes it a little bit bigger in the file size. But you want a, de a description key set that's going to handle 95, 97% of all your survey codes. Your basic top of curb, edge of pavement, edge of concrete, concrete shot, tree shots. Um, what's all implied in the description key set? Um, you'll be able to apply a point style or the marker to it. 
Uh, so if I shoot a catch basin, it'll actually bring in a catch basin symbol. If I shoot a manhole, it'll bring in a manhole symbol. But if I shoot a curb shot, it's just going to bring in the marker of an X. Um, and point label style is controlled in the description key set. Point label style, what do I want it to display next to it? Um, if I shoot a manhole, do I want it to, to just say the description, uh, storm manhole? Uh, do I want it to show me the point number? Uh, point number 5002. Uh, do I want it to show the elevation? Uh, elevation 956. Do I want it to show a combination of those three? Um, with label styles, there's ways of adding different styles. So I could show northing, easting. I could show a handful of things. But typically, you're going to see point number, elevation, description as the default point label styles. The next thing is layer control. I can tell my survey points when they come in, if it's a curb shot, put it on the curb layer. If it's a storm shot, put it on the storm layer. If it's a ground shot, put it on the, the topo layer, based off of the layer control. And the final thing that we can control is the scaling. Uh, most things that will get scaled in a survey template are going to be trees. Um, I want a 4-inch oak to look smaller than a 24-inch oak. So I'm able to control scaling based off of the block that I use for uh, my point. Whoops. Went, went too far. So let's go ahead and we'll take a look at the description key set. And I'm going to point out a few tricks within... Oops. within the description key set that helps standardize things. So I have a list of all the survey codes that CTC uses. As you know, we are a uh, major surveying company out there, and we topo 6,000 sites a year. Um, no, we just have some basic co codes in here, um, some gas, some ground shots, um, nothing too fancy. We're only looking at maybe 35, 40 codes. Um, typical survey company might have 160, give or take. Um, but what we did, let me get this back up here, um, we had a code BC, that's our back of curb shot. And so we came in and added a code BC with the, the modifier, the asterisk, and what that'll do is it'll take any survey code that starts with BC and apply the style standard CTC, which we'll get into in a second, it would apply the point label style of just description only. And then the format. Format is what's going to be displayed. The dollar sign asterisk will say plug in the full description. So basically whatever the surveyor plugs in, it will be displayed. I have capabilities of changing that to say dollar sign one. And what that will do is it will take the first parameter after the survey code. So the surveyor may have put in uh, BC1 space uh, B612 uh, for the standard min dot curb. And when I bring this point in, all it will display next to the marker is B612, because I only told it to show the first parameter after the survey code. Um, can be very handy. Uh, we will see that quite often. Oops with trees. So we have a tree code, TRC for a tree coniferous and then a TRD for a tree deciduous. We're using uh, two styles, a uh, coniferous style tree for obviously coniferous and then a deciduous style for the deciduous and we're just showing description only for the point label style. But what we're showing here is to only display the first parameter after the survey code. So your surveyor is going to go out into the field and he's going to shoot uh, TRD space 18 space maple. What this is going to do is it will bring in a tree symbol for a deciduous tree, but it's going to label it as 18 because that's the first parameter, but then it's going to put the inch symbol after it. So it will automatically say that this tree is an 18 inch tree. 
which is all good. And then, as you can, I'll show you this, you, you can see the little extra box. It's, it's showing a smaller box in front of a big box. What that is, is it's a symbol for scaling. So it's saying that these two codes are scaled. So then you come over towards the scaling parameter, and you'll see that we're scaling it based off of parameter 1, and we're scaling it 0.3%, which is that v value right there is going to change based on what size your block was originally. Um, some blocks are drawn true size, true shape, so you're going to scale it by 0 0.083 or 1 12th. Um, this block just happened to be 0.3, which made it look really nice. And then with the scaling, we're going to look at apply to x and y. So it's going to only scale it in the x direction, y direction, but it won't scale it in the z direction. Most of these blocks are just two-dimensional blocks. They're not dynamic blocks. Um, so just the x, y is perfectly fine for us. If you had a dynamic block, that when in model space it would show it three-dimensionally, then you would definitely want to apply the z-value also. I also have the capabilities of rotating my markers. So if I know my marker is always going to be um, at a 45-degree angle, I can rotate it at a 45-degree angle. That way I can use the same symbol. I could use the x marker and then the plus sign marker. So I could use the x marker, just rotate it, 45 degrees, and then it's the same thing as the plus sign marker. So I could use that same style in multiple ways. But the key on this is the style. I'm going to sort this by category on style, and you can see I have 25 codes that all use the standard CTC marker. Um, I have some edge of bit, edge of concrete, edge of gravel. I got a fence, some fiber optic, toe slopes. But if you look in my drawing, I got an edge of concrete shot here, and it's coming in cyan. I have some bit shots, and they're coming in red. But they're using the same style. How's it determining what color this thing has to be? And that's all based on the style built into the settings of the style. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to edit the standard CTC style, the one that was used about 25 times. I'm going to say Edit, and I'm going to look at the Display tab. And I, I notice in Plan View, the marker and the label go to layer 0, and the color is by layer, and the line type is by layer. This zero doesn't mean put it on layer zero, per se. What it means is it's a point style. I want you to go back to the description key set and look to see where this code is being used. And then put the color based off of that layer and then the line type based on that layer. So if I come back into my description key set and I look at my EOC, code. It's saying standard CTC, but it's telling me anytime you see an EOC code, put it on the V-node concrete layer. Anytime you see the bit code, put it on the V-node bit M layer and base the color off of that layer. So if I go into my layer manager and I look at V no bit is telling me that the color is red and the line type is continuous. Well, all my bit shots were red. Um, didn't have any line types in there yet, but um, so the continuous didn't show up. But then my V node concrete, the color was cyan. So this allowed me to make one label style, but have it print off or display in an infinite amount of colors. And that is key when you're doing uh, surveying, because I can see here all my cyan, I know it's, it's concrete shots. I know all the red shots are bit shots. I know all the yellow are centerline shots, and all this salmon color are curb shots. It makes it easy to see what things are doing 
um, by color, just by looking at that. And then I can see, hey, there's, there might be one cyan shot in here, and say, hey, wait, everything's bit there. Why is there a concrete shot in there? Find out that it was a miscode. I'm able to quick change that code to fix it. Uh, so color representation uh, helps uh, make things go smoother. And that is all, again, under the description key set. So all my styles that I have used in here are going to say, go to layer zero, but then make the color and the line type by layer. So it doesn't matter what code it was, it's going to come in and, well, it's going to see a CO for a clean out, and it's going to say, use CO style, but it's going to put, color it, style it based off of that layer, uh, C node uh, SSWR. So that's one benefit to the description key set is color management. Um, I could have a style for every one. I could have had a, a style for edge of concrete, a style for edge of bit, a style for back of curb. But if they're, they're all X's, so why not just make one and have the layer control, not the style control? <clears throat> that was description key set in a nutshell. I will play more with uh, styles as I, we go on. Um, so don't fret if you felt you didn't get enough information about styles. Um, figure prefix database. What is the figure prefix database? Figure prefix database is the database that says that if it's this code, draw a line. If it's this code, make it a break line. If it's this code, make it a lot line. Why do we care about it? It's not stored in the, the drawing. It's not stored in the template. We care about it because it's still a part of your template. You're, you're going to access this database every time you open up a new drawing. Um, the figure prefix database, again, it, it's used for creating automatic line work. It's used for creating break lines automatically. It's used for layer control. Again, if it's this code, put it on this layer. We will see this in a second. And then uh, with the layer control comes the color, the line type, and the line weight. Figure prefix database is under the survey tab, and then expand figure prefix database, right click manage figure prefix. And what this does is this shows me all my codes, all my survey codes that I know are going to generate line work. So am I going to have a code for a bit shot? No in here. Am I going to have a code for a mailbox? No. I only want codes that I know are going to be line work generated from it. So edge of bit, a building line, uh, edge of concrete, back of curb, a gutter line, codes like that. Next column you'll see are break lines. So what I can do with the break lines is actually assign the survey figure line that will be generated from these codes when you do automatic line work, that it will be a break line. So when you create break lines, it will automatically know that it should be a break line. And so it helps speeds up the process. So break line, yes or no? Lot line, yes or no? Comes into play a little bit more with plats. We won't worry about plats. Um, break lines are the key with, with a, a good survey template. And again, you have a layer manager. Uh, Put edge a bit on the V figure bit layer. Put EOC on the V figure concrete layer. And as you can see, again, I have a style, and they're all set to standard. Because when I go to my style for figures, so I'll scroll down to survey, figures, figure styles, I have a standard. Edit display. And what I'm saying is in the plan view, figure lines, which are going to be the automatic line works, go to layer zero. Color is by layer, by line type is by layer. By setting this to zero and these by layer, I have the same style standard, 
but as you can see, I have a continuous salmon colored line for my curb. I have a hidden line or a dashed line for my edge of concrete. I have a red dashed line for my edge of bit. I have a yellow center line too for any center line shots. One style displayed one, two, three, four, five, seven different ways makes things a lot easier. Um, handles everything the way we want. Uh, brings the color in to match. So you can see my, my marker and my label are the salmon color and my line type is the same color. So I can see when something sticks out if it's not right. So I have this code right here that I came in and it's popped out. It's white. It shouldn't, there shouldn't be any white shots in there. There should either be a cyan color or a red color. Uh, we're going to get into that in a second. But the figure prefix um, handles my line types. Automatic line work. And then the style, one style, I was able to have it display multiple different ways based off of setting that style to layer zero and then basing all the colors on those layers. So if I go to V figure bit, it's red, it's dashed. And then if I go to concrete, it's cyan and dashed. And then center line, center line of road, yellow and center line two. Um, obviously there is some manual setup in here. I had to create all these layers and then I had to make sure that the V figure bit was the same color as the V node bit. Um, that is setup time that I have to do, but once it's done, it's done. You don't have to worry about it again. Line work code set. What is the line work code set? Line work code set is a list of a handful of commands that tell what to do to the line. Again, why? Why do we care about this? It's not stored in the template, it's stored outside the drawing. We care about it because, again, we need the line work code set to tell our figure prefix database what to do. Um, so while the figure prefix is telling us what color and what line type to draw the line, the line work code set is telling us what to do to the line. Do we need to start a curve on it? Do we need to offset it? Do we need to extend it? Do we need to recall another point? That's what our line work code set uh, tells us. Um, so again, it helps with the, the line work commands. It's customizable. And then it, the line work code set will actually help us reduce shots. Um, you may have a building that has 15 corners in it. You're set up on the northwest corner of it. Um, you can shoot two sides of the building, but you can't get to the other two sides because the building's in the way. I can use a rectangle command or a right turn command, and I can shoot the rest of those corners just by having it pre-measured. So I could say right turn uh, 10 feet, and for my last shot, it'll actually extend that line out to the right 10 feet. Um, a negative number will go left, a positive number will go right. So there is a way to, like I said, uh, shoot a building with nine, 10 corners on it and do it in three shots. Hey, I just saved seven shots. I saved the process time of having to push another point around the building to set up just to shoot the remaining corners. Well, how many setups can you save by using the right turn command? Um, you can probably save quite a few. So let's look at the line work code set. Edit. And it's pretty basic. It's saying the delimiter is a space. So I'm going to punch in my survey code. BC for back of curb, and I'm going to say space, and what that does is it triggers the line work code set to say, hey, look below. If the next code matches any of these things, do it. So I put in BC space, and I'm going to say B, and then I hit enter as a surveyor. What that's going to do is it's going to come in and say, hey, I had a space, that's my trigger to start looking, and it said B. I have a B, it's telling me to begin a line. So it's going to start a line based off of that code BC. I'm, I now shoot some 
some other shots, and I want to end my line. I could come in and say BC space E, and now it's going to end my line. It's going to stop that line right there. People are thinking, well, God, what, what's going to happen? I, I shoot cross sections. Doesn't matter. You just have to distinguish your shots. So a typical cross section of a street, I'm going to have a ground shot, and then I'm going to have a back of curb shot, so I'm going to have a BC shot, and then I'll have maybe a center line of road shot, so I'll have a CL shot. But now I get to that second back of curb. I can't use BC again because it's recognized on the other side of the road. But I can use a BC1. So I could, on the second curb, I could say BC1 space B, and now I'm going to begin two curb lines. One BC, one BC1. And then I'm going to do a ground shot, and then I'm going to come back through, and on the second curb line, it's BC1, center line then BC, then ground shot, and it's just the serpentine method. Um, my roads, my curb lines are separated by BC and BC1, and this line of code set says only look for codes that are BC. The other one is says only look for codes that are BC1. I could come in and accidentally put in BC2, and it won't connect to either one of them. I could come in and put in a code BC space BC1, and it would actually connect to both of them because both codes are in there. Um, that is the other advantage to line work code sets and automatic line work is you can have multiple lines off of one shot. I can connect uh, a back of curb shot or continue a back of curb shot around, but I'm right at the edge of the sidewalk, so I could sh shoot an EOC at the same time. So I could say BC space EOC space B, and it's going to continue my curb line around, but it's going to start a brand new line, EOC. And it's infinite. I could, uh, there could be a power pole right there, or a fence corner. So I could shoot BC space EOC space B space FNC for fence space B, and it would con continue my curb line, it would start an edge of concrete line, and it would start a fence line. And all I have to do is just remember that this is fence, this is BC, this is EOC, or maybe EOC1 if we're going to shoot the other side of the sidewalk at the same time. Um, so there's no more take a shot, call it back a curb. Take another shot, call it edge of concrete. Take another shot, call it uh, fence begin. Uh, one code, one shot, it starts three lines. The other cool features are the horizontal and vertical offset. If Prime example on these are curb. You're shooting standard curb. B612, I can shoot top of curb, and then I can do a horizontal offset of five tenths, a vertical offset of zero, and now I got a back of curb shot, and then I got a, a top face of curb shot. I can offset it again, so I can say H, uh, now 67 hundredths, and then vertical minus five tenths, and now I have flow line based off of that one shot. Offset it again, horizontally a foot, vertically negative 42 hundredths. Now I have gutter tip for standard B612 curb. One shot is going to give me four lines. Those four lines are also going to be brake lines because in my figure prefix, I said that all BC codes were brake lines. And it's all horizontal and vertical offsets, so it's going to show true shape. Uh, if you're shooting, like I said, standard curb, that's 1,000 feet perfect time to use it. If you're in a residential area and you're shooting every hundred feet, you're going down to a surmountable curb because there's a driveway, probably the horizontal and vertical offset is not the proper time to use it. But if you're shooting a commercial parking lot and it's, like I said, 2,000 feet of uninterrupted curb, perfect time to use it. Another time to use it would be altas, especially with sidewalks because um, we're not caring about elevations, I can shoot the front edge of sidewalk and offset it six feet and, and start the, that line, and now I have the front of walk and the back of walk being drawn at the same time. If you're shooting a trail, shoot one side as long as it, it's parallel and it doesn't widen. Perfect time to use it. Alto's prime example. Um, and then when you're done 
with the offsets, you can just use that SO command and it will eliminate, it will stop the offsets and it will go back to a single line. Um, but the segments, um, rectangle, right turn, um, good codes to use. Um, you shoot two points, you say rectangle 10, and it will actually offset that line 10 feet to the right and then connect it up as a closed polygon. Um, right turn, I mentioned that, you shoot two points, you say RT10, it will go 90 degrees from your original first two points. Um, so 90 degrees right, 10 feet, and then you could just say right 10, space 8, space 8, space 8, and it would go right turn 10 feet, right turn 8 feet, right turn 8 feet. And if you put in a negative 7, then it would turn to the left, negative 7 feet. So some good codes to use in here. And I had mentioned before that these are customizable. PC, for a begin curve, you know what? We don't like PC. We like uh, BC for begin curve. Or we like PR. I can change them. I can put them any way I want. So I don't want RPN to recall a point number. I can just make it RP. I can make it whatever I want. There's no saying I have to use B, C, E, or whatever. Um, I don't have to use the space as the modifier. I can use the decimal point. Not recommended because if you ever put in a invert elevation of 3.2, it's going to see that point and start looking for a code to use. So your line work code set plays with all this information. And let's take a quick peek at uh, some of the codes. We have this code in here. We have a back of curb, move that down, one, and we began the line, and then we did a horizontal offset, another horizontal vertical offset, and then another horizontal and vertical offset, and it made all four lines at once. Once I had BC1 space B, all I had to do was put in BC1, and it continued the line until I would say BC1 space E. The key is if you look at my code, I have a nice smooth curve. And that's because I had a code OC, and OC stands for on curve. So I got BC1, and I said OC. And what it did was it took the two previous BC1 shots, extended them out tangently, and then the last two BC1s uh, right after the shot brought them out tangently, and then basically did a fillet command until it hit um, where this marker was. So I now have a nice smooth transition. Um, your survey may, may have gone out there and shot this as um, he thought that this was the PC and then he thought this was the PC. Um, this right here, I said again, makes a nice smooth transition and if I click on the line, you can see that the PC for this actually started here and it started here. Um, and it didn't make it choppy like up in here, making it uh, choppy. Um, so the way we shoot it pays dividends. In here, I used the rectangle command. We came in, shot the first one, the second one, and then we said turn right eight, then five, then two. So we went eight, then five, then two. And then we used the rectangle command, and it actually then calculated where the next point should be. So it went from here straight down and then this came over based off of this line to find that last point. So two shots I got one, two, three, four, five, six, six building lines I shot with two shots. So that is my uh, automatic line work code set. Point groups. Point groups help combine like features. So I have a point group for surface points, for plotting, for miscodes. Um, there's some hierarchy in point groups and ways to override point groups. So if you come to your prospector tab, expand point groups, you can see we have some predefined. We have one setup for plotting. We have one setup for no display. 
And then the best one is we have one called EG. That EG one, if I go in and edit it, it includes all points. So every survey point that comes into the drawing gets this point, uh, will fall into this point group. But it excludes any point that we know we don't want to use for our surface elevation. So it's going to exclude mailboxes, um, pipe shots, um, FESs, gas lines, gate valves, anything that we know won't be used as a, uh, an elevation shot. And it will calculate all that. So I can then come in under my surfaces and say create a surface, let's say EG, and then all I have to do is under definition add a point group and add EG. Say OK. And I have a surface created. Didn't have to exclude anything. I didn't because it was already done for me. Um, there is hierarchy to the point groups. Um, right now I have my miss code up top. So I move that to the top as soon as I bring in my points. And that's why I can see these three X's because it tells me, hey, that's a miss code. Oh, VTI. Oh, should have been bit. Good shot. So I'm going to quick click on it. And then point group. Oh, where is my it's not letting me change it. Uh, oh, let me uh, sorry. open for edit. Let me open my, my database first. There we go. So I can now say BIT, okay, we'll say no to the line work, but now I can click on it and say apply description keys, and it turns to the right color and code. So that miscode point group tells, lets me see that, hey, I have two more, one here and one here, that are coded wrong. They don't, they're, they're not in the description key set. So I can see this, and I can see SGB. Oh, that should have been uh, just GS. Say OK. We'll cancel out of the automatic line work. And then apply description key set, and it instantly goes back to uh, the right marker, the right color for a ground shot. Now, what I want to do is I want to set this drawing up for no display. So what I need to do is I need to put the no display up to the top. So if I right click on my point group properties, I can move no display to the top. Say apply, say OK, and now all my points turn off. So whatever point group is on top it takes precedence. Anything that's doesn't match the requirements of that point group will get filtered down to the point group below it and then below that and then below that and that's why you'll see an all points point group it's part of your template it, you can't delete it it's always there it's the catch-all it's the safety net so you don't have two or three points that make it through all the cracks but it's all based on what order things come in so I can come in and change my properties and move plotting to the top, say apply, say OK, and it sets everything up. Uh, I need to move all points up and then down, say apply, say OK. And now I can see here, here's all my catch basin shots. Here's all my tree shots with the 16 inch, so I know that this is a 16 inch tree, this is a 12 inch tree, and I can see that they're different sizes. Hierarchy, when it comes to the display, goes description key set holds true, everything goes to the description key set first, and then if it's not in the description key set, it goes to the point groups. But with the point groups, I can also uh, do what's called overrides. And I can come in and I'll actually just go to the plotting one and say properties on it. And I can say instead of none and none, I can say show all three point elevation description and then go into the override and say override 
all three. Say apply, say OK, and now all points will show a point number elevation description if it matched the include exclude for the points, which it does. So note that there's hierarchy to your point groups. Point groups are nice for setting up your plotting styles, heading, setting up your surfaces ahead of time. And I could have, in my template, created that surface, e.g., and automatically had it path to um, the point group, e.g., and then as soon as I brought in my points, all I had to do was right-click and say update. And it would have instantly populated it, and my surface would have been drawn right away. Um, the last thing I want to show on this is um, the break lines with the, the uh, survey figure database. I'm going to say create break lines under the survey tab, figures, right click, and all these survey figure lines I drew are now listed in this dialog box. And it says, hey, here's some back of curb shots, here's the back of curb one shot, back of curb two shot. All these survey figure lines are already listed. And as you can see, they're already saying, hey, I'm going to be a brake line. But there's a few in here, some storm drain pipe, that aren't brake lines. And here's a, an electrical box that it's not a brake line. So I don't need it to be a brake line. Last thing, I say OK. I give it a name of, I usually use BL, and you just say OK. And now my contours follow the brake lines. And because they're survey figure lines, that brake line is almost the curve, because it's following that as a curve. We have about five minutes left, which gives me perfect time to talk about survey user settings and then um, user-defined properties. Uh, survey user settings are just that. It's what we want to uh, set up ahead of time. It's where our databases are stored, the equipment line work, and then some figure defaults. If you click on your little icon up at the top, it brings you into the survey user settings. And this is where you set a lot of your defaults. Um, survey default base. Um, so where are my databases going to be kept? Um, gets automatically stored here. Um, equipment, if, if you're doing any uh, transformations inside Civil 3D, you want to know your equipment. Were you shooting a zero uh, offset prism? Were you shooting a zero 2900s or 2900s offset? What were you shooting? What equipment? Um, your line work processing, uh, so the, the line work code set, this is where it paths to every time it opens up Civil. And it tells you, go here, load up CTC. The figure prefix database, it says, go here, load this one. And that's where everything is set. Companies will come in, they'll get everything set up here, and they'll come in and they'll say, export. Export, and they'll export. It basically takes a snapshot of this whole screen, writes a file to it, and then you store it somewhere on your network. And then when you go and load a new computer, you say import, you navigate to where that file is at, and you say import, and it automatically changes the settings. And I don't know if I have one handy, um, so I was going to update one and show you where it was at. Um, I just don't know where I had one set. Um, so you have your survey database, uh, survey user settings, and it sets everything up. I mean. These are the critical ones, uh, the database defaults, figure prefix, and then the line work code set. Uh, but you can see, you can set up graphics. So you can show the backside prism, and it will be this color. Um, you can imply uh, erase survey points. Yes, show interactive graphics. Um, I could say yes, and it will show every point that comes in. There's a handful of tools in here that you can automatically default to show or not show. But the key, again, are the figure prefix, the automatic line work, and then the survey database. Last thing I want to show you today is user-defined properties. And this is uh, being able to shoot a catch basin and put in a code um, CB1 uh, 
and then put in an attribute for a measure down hold of say four feet, a direction of north, and then take that information from your surveyor, bring it in and automatically populate your label to, to say CB1, rim elevation, invert one elevation, and it'll actually say invert north or south or southeast, and then it'll create an expression that will take the rim elevation, so the shot, and then subtract out that first parameter of say four feet, and then tell you that exact distance. So the steps you need to take on it is first you need to create. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll um, have a survey database already in the drawing. Uh, you'll right click on it and you're going to say manage extended properties. Oops. We're going to add we're going to define all our properties in there, and then we're going to export it out. So just like we exported out that database on the survey user settings, we're going to export the settings out. So we'll create an STX underscore DEF file. From there, we're going to, um, it's kind of glitchy on here, but we'll bring in one survey point into the drawing, and then we're going to edit that one point to include all of the, the fields that we created in the Manage Extended Properties. And once we've uh, populated that information into that one point, we're going to drag and drop it into the template. So then it takes hold. And then if we re-import or we import our survey point file, it's automatically going to take that information for us and populate with rim and inverts. Um, We'll create an expression within the label style. So it'll say take the rim elevation, subtract the measure down uh, to give me the invert elevation. And then we'll take that expression and we'll apply it to the label style. Um, so in the last couple minutes, I'm going to walk through that as quick as I can. So I have my survey database here, and I'm going to say manage extended properties. I have a few of them in here already, some user-defined ones. So what I want to do is I want to say create a new one, and I'm just going to call this demo. Uh, string, character-based, double, integer-based. We'll make this one a double, and we say OK. I would go through that, and as you can see, I have one for direction one, two, three, and four, and I have a measure down, one, two, three, and four. Once I'm done with that, I would export it out, and I'm going to put it right on my desktop, say save. Say OK. I'm going to come in, and I'm going to click on one point here, and I would then come in and populate all that information for the measure down one, two, three, and four, and there just a, it's just a way to get the template to recognize the the information. So I'd come in and populate uh, one, two, three, whatever I needed to, and then I would drag and drop that point into the template. And from there, it's now more part of the template, so I can then um, create my expressions. So under settings, do, 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 point label styles, I have expressions. And what I'm going to do is I would create, let me slow down here a little bit. I would create a brand new one, say new, and I would say IE, invert, invert elevation, and I would call it five, because I already have a one through four, and I would put in the expression of taking uh, the measure down one, if, if there is a measure down one, I would subtract the point elevation or my actual shot, and I would subtract out the measure down one elevation. Um, as a quick example, I would uh, 
edit expression. So what I said here is if point MD1 exists, then take the elevation, subtract out um, the measure down, and that gives me my invert. And if it's not, return nothing. And that nothing allows it to be blank, so it, it won't show up, so you won't just see invert. And then within that, I have a label style called structure. And this comes in, and it says I have a component name for each one. And if I look at the invert 2 elevation, it just, oops, not that one. one. It says plug in um, IE1, the expression IE1 to two precision places. Um, so it takes a little bit of setup, but once I'm done with it, I can come in and look at my catch basins, and just off of that insertion of the point, it says rim 823.19, and I have an invert to the west of 819.55, and I have a south invert of 81944. So it did the math for me. Uh, get rid of Murphy. Murphy's law says if you leave it to a human, they're going to fat finger it, and you're going to end up with the long elevation for an invert. Um, that's all I have for you. Uh, we'll take questions now for the next couple minutes, if we have any questions. Um, I'll let Tim uh, rattle them off to me, and we will. Uh, uh, looks like we don't have any that have been submitted just yet. Okay. okay. If you do have a question, um, you can either raise your hand on the control panel. There's a, a button that you can put a hand raise up or type in a question in the chat window, or uh, there's also a questions tab on the control panel. I'll take this time to um, thank you for joining us. If we don't have any questions, um, wait just a few minutes if anybody does. Otherwise, you could uh, feel free to email us at info at cadtechnologycenter.com. I uh, would like to remind you to please take the survey following the webinar. Once you close the control panel, it will automatically open up in your default web browser. And uh, that, that information is very important to us in providing these webinars to you at the, the best quality that we can and the best information that is valuable to you. Scott, why don't you uh, take a couple minutes and tell them about some of the upcoming events for Civil. No problem. Uh, if, if you go to our website, cadtechnologycenter.com, go to events, um, you'll see that we have it broken down by um, discipline. And then you'll see uh, we have a, some civil and structural engineering. And you'll see that we had a design template webinar on Tuesday. We have our survey template webinar going on right now. But we have two workshops um, next week, one on Tuesday, one on Thursday. That It's a four-hour workshop, but it's going to go into a lot more detail um, than I went into in this last hour. Um, Brian's webinar he had on Tuesday, his will be go, go into more detail over that four hours. It's only $95 for the workshop. It gets you out of the office for four hours, um, but it gets you a lot more information um, to help build your templates. Um, as we get more events, uh, it'll be populated here, so check our website frequently on um, upcoming events. Okay, well if we don't have any questions coming in, that'll wrap up our webinar today. Again, thank you very much for attending, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.